Hello and welcome to episode 61 of Sensational She Geek live from Yancey Street. Today is Monday, May 2nd, 2022, which means that free comic book day is right around the corner and we will be discussing that in a segment on the podcast today. Um, but to start things off, of course, we will be beginning with the news, which of course has to begin with the tribute to the late, great, legendary comic creator Neil Adams uh, for all that he has done for the industry. Other items of news, we have a few bits of smaller news that I'll briefly go over, uh, as well as some rumors, um, a bit of a section that I'm calling coming soon, just a bunch of announcements on things coming in the future with release dates and whatnot, and uh, a, a smaller bit on three cancellations that we heard about this week. Of course, we will also have the comic book picks this week, which is a little bit shorter than usual, but we have some great stuff like Beyond the White Knight and Bloodstained Teeth, which were excellent. And the comic book poll list for the coming week being for DC Comics, things that come out tomorrow on the 3rd of May and everything else will be coming out Wednesday the 4th. There are a number of uh, number ones coming out this week. In fact, looking at my poll list, everything except for one issue is a number one in some way. Uh, and that does include the Nubia Coronation Special, which I am very excited for. So stick around. We'll talk about the poll list for this week when we get to that segment. Um, that will be followed, of course, by the Free Comic Book Day 2022 poll list. Free Comic Book Day is the annual... Um, it's an annual event that comes uh, in the industry the first Saturday of May every year after uh, being a little bit messed up because of the pandemic, but now we're back for the first Saturday of May. Uh, it's, it's meant to shine a light on the, your local comic book shops and support them, uh, but we'll go over some of the really cool stuff from various publishers that are going to be coming out on this Saturday, February, sorry, May 7th, free comic book day. Wow, May, May. <laughs> this year is flying by. And then after the free comic book day bit, we are going to talk, of course, Moon Knight episode five, titled The Asylum. There's lots of bigs ups and bigs downs, so we're going to go over all of that good stuff uh, before Young Justice season four, episode 20, titled Forbidden Secrets of Civilization's Past. And finally, the Multiverse of Madness precast is what I'm calling it, um, which is the summation of things that we know and speculate for the upcoming Multiverse of Madness movie, which, to remind you, is premiering, uh, I guess the 6th is the day that it officially comes out, but people will be seeing it as early as the 5th. Um, and it is having lots of press and things this week, so do be careful if you do not want spoilers, because I can guarantee as of Thursday, whenever those showings start happening, there will be lots of spoilers. Uh, I will be seeing it Friday and talking about it on next week's episode, spoiler free for that review. But for now, of course, we just have this prepisode, is what I guess we can call it, Multiverse of, Pod Ma Multiverse of Madness prepisode slash uh, precast, going over all the stuff, all the references, everything that you will need to know before the movie. And that is what is on the agenda for this week's episode. Um, as I always do, we start off with a little bit of the social media stuff here. Um, if you would like to be a part of the Yancey Street Discord, um, I have that linked actually in the link tree now if you want to go ahead and join that, it being a place for discussion of all things nerdy as well as, you know, general chat, vent channels, other general categories and things. Um, just know that we will kick you out if you start being a problem. <laughs> uh, my Instagram, if you would like to find me, is Anna with the Comics. My Twitter is Savage She Geek, and my website is SensationalSheGeek.Weebly.com. I have actually been doing a lot of overhaul redesigning of the website recently, um, adding a few pages to clarify stuff about the podcast, how to support the podcast trying to make it easier to track down specific episodes or segments, if that's what you'd like to do, um, as well as uh, new Q&A pages, I guess FAQ would be a better way to say that, um, and a page on a beginner's guide to comics. So if you are interested in comics but have absolutely no idea how to do the thing that is reading and collecting comics, 
I now have a beautiful and I hope well written page on uh, how to get into comics and what all lingo and jargon and everything means. So if you have questions, hopefully that will answer them. Because I am aware that it can be very imposing to try and join any kind of comic reading community for a number of reasons, especially if you are a part of a uh, any kind of minority class. So trying to make comics as accessible to everyone as possible, and that starts with understanding and getting a little bit of information on the community. So go ahead and check out the website again, sensationalshegeek.weebly.com, if you want to see what kind of changes I've been putting on there. Um, I have some fun information for various characters in comics, as well as I post my pod notes on what used to be the blog. Anything that you want to find that I would have had content-wise pre twenty pre-February 2021 was all written blog content. Um, so you can check all of that out as well. I, I, I continue to post on the blog uh, the the pod notes with the podcast notes that I take through the week and I go through to follow um, the, the plan for the podcast that in any given week. Um, and I do post those for people to go and kind of read if they would prefer to read the podcast instead of listening to me talk about it, or for anyone who is hearing impaired who would like to follow along with the events of the podcast as well. Um, you can find the podcast on pretty much any podcast hosting app, and that does include YouTube, where I have them all in a nice little playlist if that makes things easier for you to listen to them. I also post action figure review videos, the most recent being uh, the uh, SH Figure Arts Whis from Dragon Ball Super, who was re-released as the San Diego Comic-Con um, uh, exclusive or whatever for uh, probably last year, honestly. <laughs> So if you do not have a Whis yourself and you would like one, a uh, Whis from Dragon Ball Super, you can definitely check that out on my YouTube channel. I also have a tour of our entire action figure collection, um, which is about a 40 minute long video. And then I went back and added an extra 15 minutes in the second video of things that I had forgotten in the first one. So there's a ton of stuff to check out on my YouTube channel as well. I have been trying to get a little bit more involved in my podcast Patreon, which you can find under Sensational She Geek. It is set up, of course, for donations to support the podcast, and I've been pretty lax in the past year about doing anything with it, um, but I'm trying to fix that. <laughs> so starting last week, I am doing podcast after shows, which is, you know, 15 to 30 minutes of me just continuing to kind of talk about whatever relevant stuff there may be, or, you know, sometimes non-relevant stuff, whatever strikes my fancy as a extra 30 up to 30 minutes of audio. Um, and maybe in the future we will add video if it gets enough positive response. So you can go to the Patreon and check that out. Um, you can also check out in the link tree or I believe on my uh, pod notes on the website, all have links to the Kofi, Cash App, Venmo, and PayPal, which all go to support the podcast as well, in addition to the Redbubble store, which is She Geek Shop, which has some really cool um, brandified things, merch type things, I guess you would say, that are comic related as well. As I mentioned before, we are starting off the news with a tribute to Neil Adams, who passed away this week at the age of 80. Neil Adams' career spanned nearly 60 years. He was an iconic artist for both DC and Marvel Comics throughout the 60s and the 70s, drawing the likes of Batman, Superman, The Avengers, and The X-Men. As a young man, he attended the School of Industrial Art in Manhattan. He understood the value of fan support later in his career and was a fixture on the convention scene, where he was lovable, cantankerous, and a repository of comic book history who loved being a raconteur. My husband Adam and I had the pleasure of meeting Neil Adams in 2017, November 2017, in Atlanta at a convention, uh, which was a pretty big deal moment for my husband because he grew up reading alongside his father, the um, Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams kind of era of Batman stuff with, you know, Ra's al Ghul shirtless sword fights in the desert, uh, that, that whole extraordinary era uh, was kind of what he was raised on. So uh, Neil Adams being a true comic here, a true personal 
comic hero for him. Uh, meeting him was absolutely fantastic experience for both of us, especially for my husband, who, as I've been saying, is a total lifelong fan. He's a personal hero of my husband's. And we ended up buying, it was, I believe, just $40, which is pretty inexpensive. Um, it was a print, nothing original, which I'm sure would have been way more money. Um, but just a print of Neil Adams' Justice League from the side. You know, their, their por portfolio, <laughs> it's not... <laughs> profile their profile is what i was going for there um it's a it's a nice print you can definitely tell looking at it the era that neil adams was is very much a product of that classic kind of era uh, it was and he was charging people extra i think it was like an extra 20 dollars or something to have them sign as well and he would sign them we just put you know neil adams like you standard thing uh so then we come up and i think he was kind of in a dead period at the moment um but it was kind of awesome because my husband was, I have never seen him speechless before. Um, and this adult man became completely speechless in front of Neil Adams. And I just could not help but giggle um, because what, what an incredible feeling, right? Meeting your childhood lifelong hero. So he was, he was pretty speechless there and I could tell Neil Adams was, uh, he appreciated it you know you can tell that he um he definitely loves the fans and talking about the stuff that they together loved um and so seeing that adam was so incredibly speechless and such a fanboy and so thrilled and just in awe of him he actually signed it to adam from neil adams um so that was pretty awesome of an experience to have met him um even though we, we didn't get a picture i think that probably would have been more anyway but um I, I think that's a pretty incredible thing that we have now in our collection. Probably some of the best $40 we've ever spent at a con, too. <laughs> so that's my personal experience with fandom and Neil Adams. Um, but he goes obviously way beyond that, just being a creator who was back in the day. Neil Adams was a major creative force behind the Green Lantern and Green Arrow series of the early 1970s, which addressed real-life issues with commentary on racism, overpopulation, pollution, and drug addiction. If you need any kind of historical record list of contributions that Neil Adams made to the comic book community, um, or rather things that he might be known for within the comic book community, um, here's, here's a nice little list of just impressive after impressive thing. The first being one of, in my opinion, the most impressive. Um, Neil Adams was the... Well, he was behind the story, as well as he was the artist of the legendary 1978 Superman vs. Muhammad Ali comic book issue. It was written by Neil Adams, it, written by Neil Adams, scripted by Denny O'Neill, and then drawn by Neil Adams as well. So it was almost entirely a Neil Adams project. And that, to this day, is one of the most legendary single comic issues probably of all time. Um, I believe what happened in the story was they end up going to a planet with a red sun so that uh, Superman and Muhammad Ali are on the same level physically um, to level the playing field there, and then they go at it that way. And you'll just have to look it up yourself to find out who wins. Other things that Neil Adams is known for in the community, he is the co-creator of not just Ra's al Ghul, but Man Bat, Mockingbird, who of course is over at Marvel, and Jon Stewart, who was the first Black Green Lantern and the second Black superhero at Dis Disney, oh my god, at DC Comics. All four of those characters have gone on to have pretty legendary histories at their various publishers between Marvel and DC. Uh, Ra's al Ghul, of course, becoming almost a household name after being in the Nolan Batman movies, being an integral character through all three of those, really. Uh, Man Bat being a little bit more of an indie DC character, I suppose you could say, but... Um, he definitely has his fans, and he has definitely had his moments of um, being an important character in various storylines through various DC comic media. Uh, Mockingbird, of course, was featured in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. live-action show f somewhat recently in the past few years. 
she was played by Genevieve Padalecki. Is that right? Nope, that would be the wife of a guy from Supernatural. This is Adrian Palicki, is the one who I was trying to name here. <laughs> and I don't even need to tell you what a legendary character John Stewart's Green Lantern is, being one of the most popular Lantern characters in all of DC Comics. Additionally, it was Neil Adams who regrounded the Joker in his homicidal roots and revived Two Face. On the Joker, he's quoted to be have say, having said, we took a harder edge. We decided that the Joker was just a little crazy. And that really brings him to where he is today. That was Neil Adams who put him on the path to being the iconic Batman villain that he is today. He, Neil Adams, that is, he also revitalized Batman. He has a quote from a panel at San Diego Comic Con 2010. He says, It was no secret that we were doing Batman right. It was as if the memory of DC Comics went along with the statements that both Denny and I were making, that we wanted to be more realistic, more gritty. And that's how we remember, whether it was true or not, that Batman should be. And when we did, everybody went, Ah, that's it. We don't need comedy anymore. To sum that whole quote up, basically, um, it was Neil Adams and Denny O'Neill who put Batman on the map as a serious comic book character. Again, crazy, crazy important things in the history of comic books. To further add to this legend, he was a mentor to both Bill Sinkovich and Frank Miller. Yes, both of those. He had a company that he co-founded with Dick Giordano called Continuity Studios, which produced movie storyboards, advertising art, animatics, and 3D computer graphics and conceptual design. He was inducted into the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame in 1998, the Jack Kirby Hall of Fame in 1999, and the Inkwell Awards' Joe Sinnott I'm sorry, Hall of Fame in 2019. Neil Adams was also a champion of comic creators' rights for his entire career. He fought to unionize the industry in the 1970s and helped form the Comics Creators Guild, which the work of which led to a now standard practice of returning original artwork to the artist. Believe it or not, back in the day when an artist would hand over pages for Marvel or DC to use in their comics, they would never see it again. Even legendary artworks like things from Jack Kirby were um, either shredded after being used or just shoved away in a drawer somewhere. Um, and it was through the, the work of Neil Adams that the families of these creators started to finally get the work back that they're um, you know, father, grandfather, whoever it may be, relation to them had done years ago and had then gone on to make countless monies for these companies. Neil Adams also was one of the champions of an effort to get the Auschwitz-Birkenau, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, State Museum to return the original artworks of Dina Babbitt, a Jew who worked as an illustrator for Joseph Mengel in order to keep herself and her mother from the gas chamber, which is a pretty horrific story. He was a champion of two writer artists who laid the foundation for DC, Superman creators Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. You may have heard of them now, but several decades ago they were almost unknown. When he heard of their plight, one inciting factor was hearing that they could not attend a Broadway musical featuring the Man of Steel. He led a lobbying effort that eventually led to a greater recognition for the pair, a greater tag in comics, and other media that continues to this day plus a pension. This is why anytime that you see Superman used, you see Superman, you have to have um, legally uh, su some, it says something along the lines of the character Superman created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Sch Schuster with special arrangements from the Siegel family, I believe is what it was. Uh, this, the Siegel family. Actually, let me, let me Google that real quick. Yes, I was right. It was, it does say by special arrangement of the Jerry Siegel family. These are all just mere examples of the lifelong efforts that Neil Adams had to greater expand the comics community and to greater support creators within that community. 
In a Remembrance post on Facebook, Neil's son Josh Adams wrote a few things about his father. Quote, My father was a force. His career was defined by unparalleled artistic talent and an unwavering character that drove him to constantly fight for his peers and those in need. He would become known in the comics industry as one of the most influential creators of all time and champions social and creators' rights. When he saw a problem, he wouldn't hesitate. What would become of tales told and retold of the fights he fought were born out of my father simply not simply seeing something wrong as he walked through the halls of Marvel or DC and deciding to do something about it right then and there. It wasn't until I was an adult that I truly got it. It wasn't until I sat at tables at conventions next to the same people I would watch treat my father with such reverence that I understood. He was their father too. Neil Adams's most undeniable quality was the one that I had known about him my entire life. He was a father. Not just my father, but a father to all that would get to know him. A lot of this information I got from a really honestly fantastic Hollywood Reporter article on Neil Adams, which I will also be linking in the description of this episode if you would like to read more on that, and I definitely encourage you to do so. Our smaller points of news are just a couple of things I thought were worth mentioning, but I don't really have much to expand on them. The first being Frank Miller and Dan Didio, 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 (laughs) and I'll never figure that one out. I know I've heard it said many times, but I'll never remember. Uh, They have a new publishing company. It is a new indie comic publisher, so that's exciting. Usagi Jimbo is a uh, classic rabbit comic character themed after Japanese samurai who has a Netflix animation. You probably haven't heard of that because it is super weird animation. The Batman sequel has officially confirmed with Matt been confirmed with Matt Reeves and Robert Pattinson. It likely took a little while for this to be confirmed due to the straightening out of movie deals with actors and creators involved. Michael Shannon Zod is going to appear in the Flash Point, I guess, movie. He was, I believe, first seen in Man of Steel. Uh, other news, Made for Love is back on HBO Max, which is pretty cool. I haven't started into the second season yet, so I can't say if it's as good as the first. Uh, but Snowpiercer Season 3, which was quite enjoyable, is up on HBO Max uh, starting this past Friday. The two points that we are going to be talking about in the rumors subsection here is involving Wolverine and Aquaman 2. So starting off with Wolverine, uh, the casting rumors are persisting. It seems like every day we have a new rumor article spurring from another rumor article spurring from another rumor article. Uh, most popularly recently being Terran Edgerton is apparently in talks according to a handful of very obscure rumors because there have been a lot of semi-obscure comic book news sites hatching this as a scoop, I guess, for weeks now, after years of him being a fan-favorite choice to play Logan. I would normally write this off as nothing to pay attention to, but with certain other long-time fan castings apparently coming into play soon in the MCU, I can kind of see them going for this. Can't really say if it's a good idea or if uh, Taron Edgerton is going for it, But, you know, it's a possibility. Other fan favorites to play Wolverine include Daniel Radcliffe and, for some reason, still Hugh Jackman. Let the man live. (laughs) As for the Aquaman 2 rumors, apparently the Aquababy is rumored to appear in Aquaman 2 in some way that is integral to the main plot. Aquababy is, of course, Arthur Curry and Mera's son from the comics, who first appeared in Aquaman number 23 in October 1965. Aquaman of the Lost Kingdom, as the sequel will be called, will pick up years, apparently, after the events of 2018's Aquaman, featuring a stronger Black Manta as the main villain. Some fans are bleak. Some fans uh, believe the sequel may be a loose adaptation to Aquaman Death of a Prince, which is a 1970s storyline that ended with Black Manta suffocating Aquababy to death. So, great times ahead, I guess, over at DCEU. In the coming soon portion of our new segment, we're going to be covering... Spider-Verse, the Penguin series, the Kite Man series, some MCU date swaps, Sailor Moon Cosmos, 
and the tales of the jedi so starting at the top of that list with spider-verse they announced the, the release dates of part two and part three just i believe last week however they have now announced that part three is going to be not called across the spider-verse part two but have its own title beyond the spider-verse um for whatever reason there was a bit of a ruckus due to this name change but i think that it makes way more sense to just call it a trilogy instead of part one and the part one and part two of a sequel this just makes more sense to me also in this in the spider-verse news we know that Issa Rae is going to be playing or voicing Jessica Drew in the sequel however we also know now that she is going to be appearing in spider-verse five months pregnant as the news also includes she'll be riding a motorcycle and all of that, which is all taken from the 2016 Spider-Woman Volume 6 series by Dennis Hopeless Hallam, which ran for 17 issues and had her son Jerry's first appearance in issue number four. So it's not too much of a stretch to assume that we're going to be seeing her baby, likely Jerry Drew, in one of these sequels. Is it Jerry or is it Gary? It just happens to be a little bit funny that the series that they're pulling that from happens to be one of the most disliked Spider-Woman series in recent history. <laughs> uh, as far as other Spider-Verse news goes, though, uh, we did also hear this week that Across the Spider-Verse, being the sequel, will feature 240 unique characters that all had to be designed from various points in the universe. This apparently was um, re was announced to some skepticism. I guess people thought that meant that we're going to be following 240 different plot lines. So the co-writer and producer Christopher Miller took to Twitter to clarify what they meant by that. He says, to clarify, amidst, amidst the universe hopping, there are 240 unique characters that had to be designed and modeled, but they're mostly minor or background characters. The scale is grand, but the story is personal and centers on Miles and his family, along with Gwen and a handful of others. So if you had any concerns about the 240 characters, it's probably going to be like a big crowd scene. It's going to take care of at least half of those, and that's the only time we're going to see him, so don't worry. Now, the only the only um, Spider-Man character that I am just, like, really, really, really hoping is among those 240, Spiders Man. Look it up. It's great. The Penguin series on HBO Max is going to begin filming in mid-June, uh, starring Colin Farrell as Oswald Cobblepot. This is all part of the Matt Reeves Batman universe, um, and is going to be followed along with a Gotham PD show and also an Arkham show. All of those are going to be in the Reeves universe, unsure if they're going to connect or have any kind of uh, timeline of relevance to each other, um, but we know that this first one for the, the Penguin is going to be kind of a flashback series. Uh, and we know that it will be the first of these three Reeves universe Batman shows to reach us. Uh, Colin Farrell is quoted to have said, I couldn't be more excited about continuing this exploration of Oz as he rises through the darkened ranks to become the Penguin. Will be good to get him back on the streets of Gotham for a little madness and a little mayhem. There's a short synopsis from a production newsletter which says, the show is set to show <laughs> to show Penguin's rise to power over time, likely with an ending that leads right to the character we already saw on the silver screen. So pretty self-explanatory there. The Kite Man series has been put in on full order at HBO Max. We had talked a little bit about the Kite Man series before because uh, it was simply announced that they were interested in making it, and now I guess they liked what they saw in the first episode or however they do that these days, and the full season has been ordered. It will be called Noonins. It's going to be a new 10-episode comedy coming from Justin Halpern, Patrick Shoemaker, and Dean Laurie about Gotham's seediest dive bar. Noonins will focus on Kite Man as he partners up with the villainous Golden Glider to make a new name for himself at the time after Poison Ivy dumps him for Harley. Warner Brothers Animation Executive Vice President of Alternative Programming. God, what a title that is. Warner Brothers Animation Executive Vice President of Alternative Programming. Whew. Peter Girardi, 
said that while Kite Man will be one one viewer's introduction to Noonan's, he won't be the only classic DC character, heroic or villainous, to appear. In other Harley Quinn universe, animated universe TV news, the third season of the Harley Quinn show is slated to air sometime this summer. We had a bit of an MCU date swap this week, where the Marvels and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania they swapped release dates for 2023. How it stands now, Ant-Man 3 will be on February 17th, 2023, and the Marvels will be July 28th, 2023. The most obvious explanation being that the Marvels presumably needs more time in editing. They're actually still filming it now, so maybe that as well. While Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania Mania, Mania, uh, must be a little bit further along in production. According to Variety, insiders close to the matter are reporting that this is not a sign of any major difficulties, rather it is just that Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is further along in the creative process, with it being announced that the film had wrapped principal photography back in November of 2021. I could have sworn that Brie Larson announced they had done, they had finished filming the Marvels back in February of this year, but I guess not. The Marvels had originally been announced as February 2023 because they wanted it to be somewhat close to the Ms. Marvel series coming out, as they had originally slated that show for fall of 2022, which would make sense if it does in fact feature Halloween. But then Ms. Marvel was pushed up to spring slash summer, aka June, and now made even further from Captain Marvel 2, with the Marvels being pushed back to summer 2023, a full year plus after Ms. Marvel premieres. I find this a little bit confusing. According to Variety, Quantumania is expected to continue the multiverse story launched in the 2021 Disney Plus series Loki, which featured Jonathan Majors as He Who Remains, whose death creates the multiverse in the MCU. In Quantumania, I'm not sure if they actually had that right, I don't think it creates the multiverse, I think it just, uh messed up the multiverse. <laughs> in Quantumania, Majors will play the main villain and a variant of his Loki character, Kang the Conqueror. Paul Rudd, Evangeline Lilly, Michael Douglas, and Michelle Pfeiffer all are returning to Quantumania, along with director Peyton Reed. Meanwhile, The Marvels is set to tie in with two Disney Plus shows, 2021's WandaVision, which introduced Tayona Paris as the adult Monica Rambeau, and this June's Ms. Marvel, which will introduce Iman Vellani as Captain Marvel superfan Kamala Khan. Brie Larson is reprising her role as Captain Marvel, aka Cara da- Carol Danvers, and Nia DaCosta from Candyman is taking on directing duties. Interestingly, February 2023 was the original release date for Ant-Man 3 anyway, before everything in the MCU was pushed back to give Multiverse of Madness a little bit more time. Now it's back to where it was originally slated, and I guess all is well in the universe. Just a few days ago, it was announced that next summer we will have Sailor Moon Cosmos. It is set to release summer 2023 as two feature-length movies, just like Sailor Moon Eternal, covering the final arc of the manga entitled Stars. In the English edition, this is volumes 11 and 12 of the mangas. Stars was covered in season 5 of the original anime, which was episodes 167 through 200. The original anime adaptation featured numerous changes from the original manga, which series creator Naoko Takuchi, I'm so sorry, has publicly voiced her disapproval of, so hopefully they will be more accurate in this version. To be fair, though, much of the reasons that the changes were made in the anime were because the anime came out before the season was finished, season the series was finished. Again, they probably could have done something to change that. Um, I do have some links about the Sailor Moon stuff below, um, including more on the story arcs and what parts of the manga were translated into what animes, the trailer for the movies, as well as speculation on the future of the Sailor Moon franchise. You can find all of that linked below. Sailor Moon Eternal was a duo of full-length animated movies adapted from the original manga's dream arc, which premiered in Japan in January 2021 and then with an English dubbed version on Netflix the following June. The contents of the upcoming Stars arc that we'll be seeing in Sailor Moon Cosmos, we have Princess Kakyu, 
I, I'm going to probably mispronounce both of these names, I'm sorry. Uh, and the Sailor Starlights, they will be playing a major role um, in the events of the arc. Kakyu is Kakyu princess is princess of the planet Kinmoku, uh, and she had fled to Earth after her world was invaded and then destroyed by the possessed Galaxia, who was the former sailor guardian of the Milky Way galaxy. She is the ruler and future queen of the distant planet planet Kinmoku, and fled to Earth moments after her homeworld was destroyed to find the light of hope that could defeat Galaxia. Her Sailor Starlights consist of Sailor Star Maker, Sailor Star Fighter, and Sailor Star Healer. Their search for Princess Kakyu, the Starlights, brings them into conflict with the Sailor Senshi of Earth, specifically with the Outer Sailor Guardians, who want the Starlights to leave the planet and leave Usagi alone. Chibi Chibi is a new character introduced towards the end, who is introduced as being very mysterious. If Chibi Moon is a miniature version of Usagi, Chibi Chibi is a miniature version of Chibi Moon. While she tries to remain a spectator, she displays power far beyond any of the Sailor Guardians of the present when she does involve herself. She reveals her true form in the last two acts, Sailor Cosmos, a Sailor Guardian from the distant future. In an issue of Smile magazine, Naoko said Chibi Chibi is the future Sailor Moon. Since Chibi Chibi is actually Sailor Cosmos, this could mean that Sailor Cosmos herself is actually the future Sailor Moon. Despite this, many people have their own theories as to who Sailor Cosmos is. Sailor Galaxia is the main villain in this arc as well. Galaxia is Sailor Moon's strongest and most dangerous of opponents. As the self-proclaimed, quote, Golden Queen of Shadow Galactica, unquote, she directly commands the Sailor Animamates, which are her fun little team. She is the most powerful Sailor Senshi in the galaxy, as well as the ruler of Shadow Galactica. Again, you can go and see some articles about Sailor Moon, as well as the link to the trailer in the description below. The Tales of the Jedi animated anthology series is the last thing to talk about in this coming soon news segment. This was announced and it will be previewed at the Star Wars celebration coming up on May 28th. The Clone Wars executive producer Dave Filoni is involved, and it will more likely, of course, more than likely be a Disney Plus show. The original Dark Horse comic series entitled Tales of the Jedi was among the first Star Wars stories to flesh out the ancient history of the Jedi Order and their war with the Sith. Presumably, these stories will follow suit. The Tales of the Jedi comic is largely set 4,000 years before the era of the movies in a time when the ancient Jedi Order is at war with the Sith, who apparently at that point were depicted as a singular race of Force-sensitive aliens rather than the secretive order they would later become. Later Tales of the Jedi arcs delved, in for, delved even further back in the Star Wars timeline, exploring a period 5,000 years before the movies. The series is largely about the rise and fall of Ulic Keldroma, a Jedi Knight from Alderaan who becomes corrupted by the dark side. Over the course of the series, Keldroma battles the Sith Empire and falls in love with fellow Jedi Nomi Sunrider, only to succumb to temptation of darkness himself. While this upcoming series will obviously not focus on a singular character, if it is in fact an anthology series, we might see episodes about characters from the original comic series, and certainly all the episodes will de will delve deeply into many stories of the same ancient era. Our final news segment here is on cancellations, of which we have three that were announced this week. The first was Batwoman on CW. I admit I did not watch the show, and I did not talk about it very much on the podcast. Um, but it has been cancelled now after going through two different Batwomen and trying to do things a whole bunch of different ways. It doesn't seem like any of it really panned out for them, but they tried and I admire, admire them for that. Uh, also cancelled in a less uh, relevant way, I guess, Space Force on Netflix, which is just a fun comedy thing about Space Force. <laughs> uh, it was really funny, but they cancelled it. I guess it's not coming back. I, I assume season two just didn't strike people the way season one did. I thought it was pretty dang funny, but it is what it is. Finally, uh, I think I had mentioned this at one point, but John Watts, who worked on the Spider-Man trilogy, 
uh, was working on the whatever the upcoming Marvel Fantastic Four MCU project is, and this week it has been announced that he is actually exiting that project because he needs a break after doing three Spider-Man movies back to back. However, things are ending on good terms, and so he will more than likely be back another time for another project at some point in life. In the comic book picks segment, these are comic books that came out last week, the 20, uh, 26th and 27th of April. We're going to talk Batman Beyond the White Knight number 2 of 8, Bloodstained Teeth number 1, Dark Knights of Steel number 6 of 12, Thor number 24 with some uh, brief m- comments on Harley Quinn 14, Silk 5, and Justice League 74. There was a fair amount of stuff I did not get to reading in time this week, um, but hopefully we'll be able to cover those in the coming week's episodes. So starting off with Batman Beyond the White Knight number 2. This is of 8, as mentioned before, and it is DC Black Label, so again, nothing here is canon to the main DCU. This is all just the Murphyverse being created by Sean Gordon Murphy. So... Uh, Starting the story where issue two pretty much ended, we learned that about a month ago, Dick Grayson saved Terry McGinnis from being arrested for assault when he beat up the man who killed his father. It's Dick who introduces Terry to Derek Powers, the guy bankrolling the GCPD. Terry hires, no, Derek, Derek hires Terry to be the new Batman, supposedly is where we're led to believe here. Meanwhile, in the current time, um, when when Dick finds out that Bruce escaped, he immediately suspects that it was Jason's doing, which it kind of was. Um, and then when he orders Duke as his boss of the GCPD to arrest Jason, Duke quits. Um, and I just have to note that Dick has a number one dad mug on his desk, which is notable because... Um, Bab shows up later, we'll get that to that in a second, but um, remember we ended that last issue by Bruce seeing Jack Napier, who is of course the Joker, uh, and is dead. So uh, it turns out that he is seeing Jack because of a projection from inside his mind from a chip that was implanted when Jack slash the Joker knocked him out in the past. Jack tells Bruce that think of him like Robin, Alfred, and the Bat computer all rolled up into one. Dick shows up in full GCPD gear and they fight, and it is Jack who tells Bruce how to beat the fancy new suit. After this, Bab shows up to uh, Dick's office, I guess, and they argue. And it is slightly alluded to that she might be the mom to the kid who gave him that best dag mug. And then that things just clearly did not work out between them. Bruce breaks into where he was keeping his last bat suit, which turns out to be Harley Quinn's basement. She says that she wanted to see him because he is her husband. Plot twist to be continued. Say what? Uh, loving it. I, 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 Sean Gordon Murphy does great with these like alternate world twists. I just love it. It's fantastic. Bloodstained Teeth, number one, comes from Christian Ward as a writer. Um, He is a fantastic artist, so I'm really happy to see that he is getting to do some fun indie writing as well. In this story, we are following Atticus Sloan, who is a vampire for hire. He turns people into vampires for money. One thing that was a pretty cool reveal was that Bram Stoker is the head of vampire PR, pretty much, in this universe, which is awesome. Uh, There's a guy called Mr. Tooth, who is the heavyweight vampire with what appears to be one gold fang, if I'm not mistaken. Um, The the layout of the universe for the vampires is that firstborns are what you call the elite vampires who are born vampires. And then you have Sips, who are turned vampires. And firstborns cannot feed on a Sip that they themselves turned, or else they would get wildly ill, apparently. Uh, Bram Stoker, who again, Vampire PR, finds out what Sloan, Atticus Sloan, Vampire for Heart, Truth Bill for Money, he finds out what he's doing, threatens him with death, death if he doesn't turn down, doesn't hunt down all the sips he's ever turned and kill them, like Mr. Tooth killed his own familiar, a sip. He has three weeks to do this. The art feels honestly perfect and gothic, with coloring being fantastic and bright in contrast. It works out really, really well as a combination. 
this book sets up an entirely new world, which is tricky to get readers caught up on uh, in the first issue, or caught on to, possibly, in the first issue. Um, knowing how much detail to give, how not much to give, not too little, um, for, the, for the reader's brain to be able to accept this reality that you're painting for them. Uh, I would say Bloodstained Teeth definitely gets it right on. Um, nothing is too complex yet, and uh, it's all at a level that we can pretty easily accept and understand what is going on. Dark Knights of Steel by Tom Taylor, number 6 of 12, art by Yasmin Putri. In this issue, we learn that Tim Drake is buddies with Constantine in the Kingdom of Storms. Um, he tries to comfort Com Constantine in the beginning of this issue, but f turns out that he knows that Tim Drake is one of Robin's Batmans, so he rats him out, they fight, um, and then he gets electrocuted and they decide that they're just going to let him go free and warn, you know, Batman about whatever is coming. So he tries to report to Batman, but Batman is still missing. So he goes ahead and tells the rest of the, uh, the, the kingdom of elves that Zala killed King Jefferson, which she of course denies. Constantine summons Etrigan, the demon, so that he may speak with its host, Ra's al Ghul. Didn't see that one coming. Um, he asks Roz to bring him back to the king as he to bring back the king and his son, because uh, I think they're saying that Constantine was in love with the king, which is kind of an interesting twist. But Jefferson's body is far too destroyed. However, the son's body will work, but the payment that Roz wants is the Titans, who he says Constantine has hidden away. Um, I'm excited to see what the Titans of this world look like. Meanwhile, Kalel goes to Amazonia to talk to Hippolyta. He is pretty douchey about it, so it's understandable when they stab him and jail him. He ends up tied up with the lasso of truth, and Lois Lane speaks with him. She can see that someone is behind all of this confusion and intends to discover them. So I'm I'm a little bit into this uh, Lois Lane meeting Kalel thing. I kind of like that. Super excited for the next issues. This is a fantastic Elseworlds style series. Thor number 24 was the legacy issue 750 landmark issue as well as the funeral of Odin. Uh, we had a couple of different stories that were playing out in this issue. One being the origin of Beta Ray Bill. Um, and the main story, it was very strange to see that Angela was suspiciously uninvolved with the funeral and Freya was back in her queen's outfit from several years ago. So not really sure what that continuity is about, but all right. Uh, Thor ends up writing his will with a human lawyer. He says if he should die, he'll be sent among the star, the storms of Saturn, which is honestly foreshadowing something that is coming for him. Um, not really sure what the Loki stuff was. Um, I, 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 the best that I could kind of figure was it was Loki of the sixth universe looking to the present, which gets into something super, super complicated about the 616 is in like their seventh or eighth universe right now. <sighs> Let's not get into that, but I, I I think that may have been what they were talking about there. And I guess Collectus's mom is a TVA agent. I not into that. Um, and then Odin uh, is now in the hammer because Valhalla got destroyed, which I guess he has nowhere to go now. Which is weird because in myth, Freya actually has her own afterlife place too. It's not everybody who dies goes to Valhalla. That's Odin's afterlife. Freya has an afterlife as well that she takes half of people to and he takes the other half to Valhalla. Wish they would bring that up, um, but I guess I'm just too into mythology for my own good. <laughs> Harley Quinn number 14. In this issue, Batwoman figures out that Harley did not commit the crimes she's in jail for and is kind enough to get her out. Uh, Batman style, pretty much stealing her out. And I am pretty sure that this uh, supposedly secret new villain is Kevin's girlfriend, and I'm pretty sure that it's very obvious. Silk number five, for some reason, Cindy doesn't tell her brother what happened to her, um, when she clearly needs the help because she is now old and her shit don't work no more. Uh, so she goes to J. Jonah Jameson for help, I guess, and... Um, they end up uh, finding out where the witch is, who is trying to start her her ritual. 
witch roll ritual, get it? Okay. And finally, Justice League number 74 was no bueno. In my opinion, it was not good. It felt so lame and cheesy. Um, you know, the, the random Justice League members going, for the multiverse! I kind of wanted to barf a little bit. It was so cringe. Um, I don't know, maybe some people liked it, but I genuinely did not. <laughs> Moving on to comic book picks for the week. I'm sorry, pulls for the week. <laughs> Things coming out tomorrow for DC Comics on the 3rd and everything else on Wednesday the 4th. Uh, everything I have on this week's pull list is a number one or a one shot or a special in some way. So they are all going to have their solicitations next to them, uh, except for the final one, which I'll start with, I guess, because it's Batman Killing Time number three by Tom King. Uh, and that's all you need to know about it. So the rest are going to be number ones, starting with Red Sonia Red Sitha number one by Mirka Andolfo and Valentina Pinti from Dynamite Comics. Behold, the daughter of fire, once possessed by Zamul, the spirit of the flame that possessed her. That's a really bad writing. Sitha the Red Sitha the Red has chosen to follow the path of the sword, inspired by the courage of her adopted mother, Red Sonia. Ten years have gone by, and Sitha is a young bounty hunter, always on the trail of the most dangerous criminals in the kingdom of Aquilona Aquilonia. Until one day, someone returns from her past to involve her in a mission bordering on suicide. Twig number one is by Scotty Young and Kyle Stram from Image Comics. It says, It's the first day of Twig's new job as a journeyer on Jeff Smith's bonus quest to save the Dark Crystal slash Labyrinth style world. Whew, mouthful. Join our hesitant hero for an inspiring and imaginative tale of hope, heartache, and determination to overcome insurmountable odds. Metal Society number one comes from Image Comics by Zach Kaplan and Guillermo Balbi. Port of Earth writer Zach Kaplan teams up with hot and up hot up-and-coming artist Guillermo Balbi in a dramatic new sci-fi miniseries that's Blade Runner meets Rocky. In an inverted future, evolved robots have resurrected humans from manual labor. <laughs> I can't get over how great that is. When a tribalistic cultural crash clash breaks out, a fearless human fighter and a frustrated displaced robot will square off in a public MMA cell fight of epic stakes to determine once and for all who reigns supreme, man or machine. Dogs of London number one comes from Aftershock Comics by Peter Milligan and Art Artisida, who is the artist. How deep must you bury a body to make sure it doesn't haunt you? Frank and Terry are about to find out. They were once members of the Dogs, a feared gang who ruled much of London's underworld back in the swinging 60s. They thought they'd escaped their troubled pasts, but the past isn't dead. It's just bashed about a bit and very pissed off. Spanning, three, spanning different times and classes, Dogs of London is a brutal, bloody tale of violence, love, revenge, and sleeping dogs who refuse to roll over and play dead. The Nubia Coronation Special is coming as your prelude to Nubia Queen of the Amazons number one. It is by Vida Ayala and Stephanie Williams, with art by Marguerite Savage and Colleen Duran, with Daryl Banks and Jill Thompson. After the events of Trial of the Amazons, a new era for those warriors has dawned. These warriors. Amazons from around the world have come to Themyscira to witness history and the crowning of their new leader. She stood between man's world and the dangers of Doom's doorway for centuries. When she was called upon to serve her people, she stood strong and clear-eyed, unafraid to look certain death in the face. She has united her peoples on the brink of war. All hail Queen Nubia, champion of the three tribes. Join us for an awe-inspiring special celebrating the mysterious past, thrilling present, and promising future of the, new ca of the character, and for the first time, Nubia's origin will be revealed. You won't want to miss this mo moment in Wonder Woman history that is certain to influence stories for years to come. Star Wars Obi-Wan number one is by Christopher Cantwell, who you might recognize from the Iron Man series, and Ario and Nindito. Younglings challenge fast approaches the ultimate deadly one of ultimate destiny one of the Jedi's most renowned masters Destiny of one okay that those just phrase weird as she, as he spends his final days in the remote deserts of Tatooine Obi-Wan Kenobi takes time to reflect on and record key moments of heroic life 
a heroic life long lived. Writing in old leather-bound journals from his hermit's hut, Obi-Wan remembers his days as a young Jedi initiate, his trials as a Padawan, the crucible of Jedi knighthood and the Clone Wars, and some of the earliest challenges he faced as a master of the Force. In this tale, Obi-Wan considers a watershed youngling adventure he narrowly survived on Coruscant when he was but eight years of age. This is just the beginning of his Jedi journey. Giant Size X-Men Thunderbird number 1 comes from Nyla Rose, Steve Orlando, and David Cutler. All Elite Wrestling superstar Nyla Rose slams into Krakoa with a back-breaking one-shot featuring the first X-Men to die in action. In this mega-sized one-shot, she teams up with comics star Steve Orlando and first, first Nation artist David Cutler to grapple with the ramifications of Thunderbird's recent resurrection. The world John Proudster has returned to is completely different from the one he once knew. Looking to find a refuge in the familiar, Thunderbird seeks out someone from his past at an Apache reservation and uncovers a horrifying threat to the indigenous mutant community. Will Thunderbird be able to, survive, to save his people, or will his justified rage lead him astray? Next up is the Free Comic Book Day 2022 poll list. So poll list for this week, 2.0. Uh, Free Comic Book Day, to remind you, is coming Saturday the 7th. And uh, all of these comics that I'm going to list are, you guessed it, free. Uh, most shops have a limit on how many you can get. Um, as in, you can probably only get one per issue, but how many selections you can make among the free comics. So you'll definitely want to know in advance which you are going to want to pick out. Okay, we're going to start off with one that I have absolutely no information on, except that it's going to have a character uh, based on the real-life Jack Black in it. It's called Cult of Cable Feet Jack Black. It's coming from Behemoth Comics, and that's all I got about that one. Uh, moving on, Avengers X-Men number one. It has three stories of deviation and mutation, Bloodline, and Let's Talk About Krakoa. It says, written by Kieran Gillen with art by Valerio Shitty. Judgment Day will see the Avengers try desperately to avert a war between the Eternals and the X-Men. Fans will get their first glimpse at the conflict in Free Comic Day, Avengers X-Men, with a prelude story by Kieran Gillen and artist Dustin Weaver. Also coming this summer will be the X-Men's second annual Hellfire Gala. Last year, mutant kind terraformed Mars and announced a new team of X-Men. What do they have in store for the Marvel Universe at this time around? Uh, find out in a lead-in story by X-Men scribe Gary Duggan and artist Matteo Loli. It also marks the exciting debut of a new hero that Marvel has big plans for this year. Meet Bloodline in an introductory story by writer Danny Lore and artist Karen Darbo. As a reminder, Bloodline is Blade's daughter. From DC, we have Dark Crisis Special Edition number zero. Witness the rise and fall of the Justice League. The event years in the making is here with Dark Crisis. Even though DC said they weren't going to do crisis events anymore. <laughs> the Justice League is comics' greatest super team. Made up of DC Comics' legendary superheroes, they have saved the world countless times. No crisis was too much for them to handle until now. The Justice League has been defeated by the Great Darkness and its army of DC's most dangerous villains. Now a new generation of heroes must rise to protect not only the multiverse, but also the legacy of the DC Universe, a prelude to DC's biggest story of 2022. It includes a preview and art from Dark Chris No. 1 coming in June. This is going to be coming from Joshua Williamson, Jim Chung, and Daniel Sempere. Over at Titan Comics, we have Doctor Who comic number one. Exclusive lead-in to an epic new Doctor Who story arc launching May 2022. An epic adventure with the Traveling Time Lord, this issue serves as a lead-in to the explosive new story arc that reveals the very early years of the Doctor. Past, present, and future all collide in a Doctor Who tale that's out of this universe. Um, if you are familiar with the new origin, kind of, sort of, of the Doctor, um, and the character, the version of the Doctor who you meet when you learn of that origin, the, like, pirate one, I guess she's kind of pirate-like, um, she is the one that this is going to be about. And also, it will be written by Jody Hauser. Over at Marvel again, we have Marvel's Voices number one. 
Free Comic Book Day 2022, Marvel's Voices number 1 will be a unique introduction to the groundbreaking and critically acclaimed Marvel's Voices series, which spotlights creators and characters for across Marvel's diverse and ever-evolving universe. The book will include new and popular Marvel's Voices stories, spotlighting creators and characters from different cultures, communities, and identities. The writers include John Ridley, Jeffrey Verge. Alyssa Wong, Evan Narcisse, Nadia Shamas, Luciano Vecchio, and Leonardo Romero. Artists include Luciano Vecchio, Leonardo Romero, Wilce Portaccio, Olivia Coppel, and Genoa Lindsay. Another Marvel title is Spider-Man Venom number one. Uh, it says Spider-Man is gearing up for a brand new era just in time for the character's 60th anniversary. Fans who pick up free comic book day Spider-Man Venom number one will see the very beginning of the major storylines writers Zeb Wells and legendary artist John Romita Jr. have planned for their run on Amazing Spider-Man, including Tombstone's first steps towards becoming Spidey's most terrifying villain. They always say stuff like that. Free Comic Book Day Spider-Man Venom number one will also give fans a chance to check out the thought-provoking work Al Ewing, Romby, and Brian Hitch are doing on Venom. The groundbreaking, br- the, the groundbreaking changes this mastermind trio has in store for the symbiote mythos starts here. We have two more. The Bone Orchard Mythos number one comes from Image Comics. A troubled writer books a secluded cabin on a serene lake in an attempt to get away from his struggling marriage and his impending deadlines. But what he can't know when he arrives is that he is already in the cabin. In fact, he may have been always he may have always been there. Face to face with his own demons, the writer discovers the first terrifying pieces of the Bone Orchard Mythos, a sprawling new horror interconnected universe from Eisner award-winning team behind Gideon Falls and Primordial, Andrea Sorrentino, and Jeff Lemire. Finally, the last free comic book day title we will talk about for this year is The Guardian of Fukushima, number one. March 11th, 2011. A massive earthquake off the coast of Japan triggered a devastating tsunami which, in turn, destroyed the three core reactors of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. This tragedy cost almost 20,000 lives and devastated countless more, including Naoto Matsumura, a farmer ordered to evacuate from the deadly radiation zone. Unwilling to abandon his beloved animals, Matsumura chose to return home to his farm and to fight for the beauty of life. This powerful graphic novel from France, from France, really, intertwines Matsumura's story of human resilience and compassion with the compelling mythology of Japanese folk tales. It is coming from Tokyo Pop and is by Fabian Grillo and Ewan Blaine. Our next segment is on Moon Knight, Moon Knight episode 5, which was entitled The Asylum. The fifth episode, which is the penultimate episode, premiered on the 27th, and we are going to be seeing the finale this week on the 4th. So make sure you come back to next week's episode to get the coverage on the finale. Um, As I had kind of mentioned before, there are some big ups and some big downs here for me, so we're going to cover this as best as we can, so... Uh, flipping back and forth between Duat, uh, b- between being in the Duat with Tarit, which is where they are in the, which is what the asylum is, and being in an appointment with Dr. Harrow at Putnam Medical Facility, which Putnam Medical Psychiatric, or sorry, Putnam Psychiatric Hospital is the title um, of the hospital where young Mark was sent to by his father uh, in the Jeff Lemire Moon Knight series uh, when Mark's early signs of DID began manifesting. Um, on Tarret, a uh, fun fact, she, the actress who, who voiced her also did motion capture for her and wore a version of her outfit while on set, as well as some enormous platform shoes that were meant to represent her feet. Um, but I really, I really enjoyed in general, uh, Tarret on the show. Um, I think she was done really well. So, uh, she tells Mark and Stephen they are in the Duat, which is the Egyptian afterlife. He is definitely dead, she confirms. Uh, the Duat is incomprehensible, so it appears to you as a familiar place, in Mark's case, a psychiatric ward. She says they're on their way to face judgment at the gates of Osiris, but their scales must balance before doing so. 
Um, she pulls a stack of papyrus rolls out from her robes to do her little welcome to the Duat speech, uh, but she is interrupted by both Mark and Stephen. There are several references, or well, at least one reference here, to the Ancestral Plane, aka where the kings of Wakanda go to become Black Panther and confer with their ancestors. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so that may be a future connection to uh, Black Panther to Wakanda forever. Uh, and then they go through the, uh, Mark and Steven go through the asylum doors, and there is the full Duat, aka Tawaret's boat drifting in the desert sands towards eternal judgment. The scale she uses to weigh the hearts of Stephen and Mark come from traditional ancient Egyptian mythology, which said that when you die, your heart is weighed against a feather of Maat, the goddess of truth and justice, symbolizing harmony to see if you were a decent person in your life. Now, Mark's backstory is... Um, Mark's kind of journey here is is explained a lot in this episode. Um, Mark and Stephen have to balance the scales so that they can go to the field of reeds, but it soon seems that this means remembering all of the ugliness of the past, and so this is where we get Mark's backstory as they walk through the halls of Mark's memories. It starts with Mark's younger brother, Randall, who drowned in a cave when the ties ro tide rose too quickly when they were children. Their mother immediately and consistently blamed Mark for his brother's death and treated them as if he had done it on purpose, like he was some kind of curse to the family. In the comics, Randall is a character, but he did not die as a child. He grew up to become a Moon Knight villain called Shadow Knight. Um, and in the show, you see Randall draws, young Randall draws a picture of a one fin goldfish, uh, presumably uh, referencing Gus, which Stephen gets when he is older. Um, and I was just wondering, because of the way the MCU timeline is shifted, um, does it check out that that could be Nemo he was drawing with the little fin and the big fin? Would that work out timeline wise? I think it might. I don't know. Uh, also, Later's Gators was what he used to say to his mom as a child before things started to go wrong. Uh, so when the Steven personality comes out as an adult, he uses that to say goodbye on every phone message to his mom, which is super tragic. <laughs> Mark's childhood bedroom has posters from a Tomb Buster series starring Stephen Grant, Dr. Stephen Grant, as well as a myriad of space-related items. It's noteworthy because in the Lemire run, he briefly introduces an altar that appears to be some kind of astronaut. In fact, the Tomb Busters poster has Easter eggs of the creator's names on it. You have Doug Munch, and Don Perlman, the duo responsible for creating Moon Knight back in 75. Other Easter eggs among the names include Melissa Russell, who is the wife of the showrunner Jeremy Slater, and Dylan Beck, who is a crew member. We learn that Mark created Stephen as a child as a coping mechanism for his mother's abuse after Randall died. She would drink and then beat him, and his father couldn't bring himself to help. So Stephen came into play to look at the world as a little bit brighter than what Mark could. With this, the MCU is definitively giving Mark the sort of mental health issues he has from the comics, meaning that he has uh, multiple personalities that he's have developed over time to cope with various traumas. It was also this episode that we get the full confirmation of Mark's Jewish heritage and religion first seen at his brother's funeral. Later, after his mother's death, Mark can't bring himself to attend her funeral for obvious reasons. His father looks out the window to see Mark on the street, debating on if he will go in or not. When he sees his father watching, he shakes his head and retreats. When he walks away, he takes a swig from a flask, and we see he was wearing a kippah, or a yarmulke, so he had to have been planning to go in, but in the end, it was just too much. In easily the most emotional scene from the series, Mark's breaks, Mark breaks down on the street, crying and beating his kippah to the ground. He is distraught. After a few moments, his anger changes to grief and regret. He picks up the yarmulke from the street to wipe it clean and straighten it out again, apologizing and holding it to his chest. Then Stephen takes over, putting the grief to the side with his happy unknowingness. 
Moving through the Duat ship, they come across a room full of dead bodies, which are all Mark's victims, presumably under Khonshu and not as a mercenary. He remembers where all of them were from and insists that they were bad people, even if he didn't sound convinced himself. When they see the flashback to the night Mark tried to save Layla's father, Mark fills in Stephen about what happened and he, that, that he had a partner or boss called Bushman who betrayed Mark and left him for dead. Bushman has been mentioned a few times as we go through the podcast Moon Knight recaps already, and now we have it fully confirmed that he was the one to quote-unquote kill Mark. He's got the same role in the comics as an ally who betrays Mark and leaves him for dead, which in turn initiates the deal with Khonshu. His origin as Moon Knight mimics the comics beautifully, with several shots resembling very specific comic panels. One thing that's different is, instead of being on the verge of death from his wounds, Mark is actually about to shoot himself in the head when Khonshu speaks up to him. And I, for one, am very curious as to why they made that change, because it feels like something you only would do on purpose for a reason. Um, it's quite a notable change. Uh, then back in the maybe office of the maybe psychologist, Dr. Harrow, uh, he is still at his appointment with maybe Mark. <laughs> Nobody's really sure what's going on uh, in that particular moment. He manages to get Stephen to come out for a little bit and gets him to understand that, yes, his mother is dead. Another really great emotional scene. Um, and then he says, do you think you created Stephen to hide from all the awful things you've done in your life? Or do you think Stephen created Mark to punish the world for what your mother did to you? Which was quite an interesting line. Uh, and then in the Duat, souls are dropping into the desert like flies. Apparently, Harrow is already judging and condemning souls before their time. Tauret agrees to turn the ship around in order to help Mark and Stephen stop Arthur. The gate back to the land of the living is Osiris's gate, the god, of the, the god of the dead, resurrection, and life, and was the ruler of the dead in the underworld. Taura explains even if she, he does go through and get back to the land of the living, it won't fix the gunshot wounds that ended up killing him in the first place. But first, tragedy strikes as the dead drags Stephen from Taurat's boat, pulling him into the sands and turning him to stone, it would seem. But after that, Taurat says the scales are balanced, so it's a bit of a win-lose. And it does make you think of episode one, when the little girl in the museum asks if it sucked when he got rejected from the field of reeds, so I guess that's full circle. Uh, and then next we see Mark finds himself standing in a wheat field, uh, amidst a beautiful sunrise and cut to credits he's made it to the afterlife um, a couple of things there were some hints at Jake Lockley hints um, yeah hints at Jake Lockley uh, one of which was there was a victim from New York that was mentioned in the room full of Mark's victims Jake lived more or less in New York uh, also Jake seemed to be slipping out a little bit uh, when Harrow called the aides into his office and Mark suddenly had a bandage across his nose, which is something that Lockley would sometimes have in the comics. And he goes and he picks up the glass pyramid to attack Harrow and starts talking in a bit more of a, like, Jersey kind of accent, looking particularly manic. I would argue that, that is a that could be a scene where Jake is coming out. And then, of course, from previous episodes, The Third Coffin... Um, and someone having taken over the body and killed a bunch of dudes and it wasn't Mark or Steven. So um, it doesn't really make sense why they would hold him off to the end, to the last episode. Um, and it definitely doesn't make sense why they would put all of those hints in and not show him. Um, so a little bit, a little bit uncertain. Uh, and on that note, from, uh, let's see, comingsoon.net, I, I was reading their review, <laughs> and this, this final, I think it was the final line of their review, really stuck with me. <laughs> Where is this all going? After the tremendous buildup, you can't end the series on a typical action beat. There has to be so much more to come in the final episode. Come on, Marvel, don't botch the landing. Isn't that the concern now? Don't botch the landing, which we'll get to the criticism in just a second. But we didn't see Layla through any of this episode, which I feel is pretty noteworthy, um, regardless of 
it being because they're in the duat, I think. Um, it does make me wonder what she's up with, up to in the meantime. She knows that Conchu was, uh, was put away to stone after seeing Mark shot. Uh, so maybe she's on a mission to release all the trapped gods. Uh, sudden chaos among the gods is probably a pretty good way to stall what Harrow is up to. Um, and then my theory with the whole what's real and what's not thing after this episode, um, basically everything from the last episode's Asylum was just the entryway to the Duat, right? Full of symbols and recognizable figures from his life, things that would have made supposedly, you know, meant to put him at ease. Not this doesn't go that way. Um, but then in this episode, we meet Tara and it seems to break through to an additional layer um, to what Dr. Harrow is now calling reality, where they're in his office, um, and he's saying that all that other stuff is false, and that Mark is actually in a psych ward. With with all of that, I feel like the Duat and Tawaret is what Mark is actually going through, his soul or whatever, and then the stuff with Harrow, which would appear to be a layer beyond that, kind of, um, that is Harrow using Mark's body or something somehow to try and break into his mind and trick him into revealing how the scales will tip for him because Harrow has been infatuated with Mark's scales being so topsy-turvy this whole time. And there is a fair amount of criticism for this season of Moon Knight, and I have to say that a lot of it is justified, starting with criticism on mental illness. Um, there's a quote from Bleeding Cool that I would like to say here. It says, The show has not used terms like insane much, if at all, but in this episode, instead of Mark or Stephen saying that they are men that need help, now they are men that are insane because of their illness. To see a show that tried not to use that stigmatizing language suddenly revert in the 11th hour was a shame to see. As we had said in previous reviews, that language is important when it comes to normalizing mental illness. You don't want to use terms like that even when referring to yourself. Uh, they were also very unclear, they have been so far very unclear about portraying DID. And another line from Bleeding Cool, which I do have that article or that review, I suppose, linked in the description, it says, the implication of the final scenes of the episode, provided this isn't cleared up in the finale, but all we have is the knowledge we have right now, is that Mark's soul is, quote, balance without Stephen, as if he was somehow, quote, wrong with Stephen. Again, it is not a deliberate form of saying that Mark was broken with Stephen and now he's fixed without him, but that is the implication they are showing in those final minutes of the show. This might be rectified in the next episode. Um, another article, uh, I believe it was Inverse, who had an issue with uh, with the show as well. Um, they have specifically had the issue with the episodic pacing of the show. They say a giant red flag has appeared on the horizon, and it is one that we have seen multiple times with the Disney Plus Marvel shows. The last episode is here, and there is a lot of ground left to cover. And then one inverse writer holds no punches in their review of the show being unbearable. So I have that review linked as well, because you may be curious what what they find unbearable about it. Uh, and then finally, on Mark's Jewish identity, some fans have tried to call out Marvel for casting a non-Jewish actor. I think that argument that has more sense is the critique of him smashing the yarmulke on the ground as a non-Jewish actor. I myself not being completely knowledgeable about Jewish traditions. Uh, maybe you are. Is is there like some kind of blessing or something that that goes through where the movie could have been using like a like a fake one? Um, I would imagine that that's how they could have done that, right? But then I would still, as again, not being a Jewish person, I don't know if that would still be as uh, semi offensive as if it was a real one. Um, if if that is if there is even a difference between real and fake, so um, that's this episode, episode five, penultimate episode. It was a bit, it was a bit. I mean, it was a lot, but again, the ups, big ups and big downs, and a fair amount of just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen next. And yes, it is, it is a little bit off. <laughs> um, the the episodic pacing, the episodic layout, 
Um, it, 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 it either feels like six episodes is not enough time or it's just poorly managed time. Um, but we'll see if they kind of make that feel a little bit more reasonable in the final episode, which does premiere this Wednesday, May the 4th be with you, um, which is, of course, the day before Revenge of the 5th. <laughs> Now, fairly briefly, we will go over Young Justice Season 4, Episode 20, which was called Forbidden Secrets of Civilization's Past. Um, we'll go through the different plot lines here, starting with Ma'ala Fa'ak, who has disguised himself as Orion, to get intel from, or for, the Zod kid, Lore Zod. They then go to Metron's storage unit, or whatever you might call it. Uh, they get attacked by some red mists, and so they have to take refuge in their little time capsule and hide from uh, the mist, which is, I guess, a planet eater. Not scary at all. Um, when Metron gets pushed back through the boom tube, as seen in the last episode, Lorzod takes his opportunity to attack Metron. After some light torture, he seems to give in to with what they want, uh, leading them to where he has hidden the projector for the Phantom Zone. But of course, it's a trick, and the box actually contains kryptonite. He sends the red mist to them, which I guess he controls it, and then he can escape. Uh, Mantis ends up saving them and takes them backwards a day, so there's going to be some issues here. Meanwhile, Gar, Garfield, Logan, the uh, uh, Beast Boy, he goes to therapy. Um, it... it it's pretty obvious that he's lying the entire time about how he how he's doing so great and it does not take very much questioning from black canary to get him to completely crack he says he believes he is the reason that connor died after more talking it's pretty much discovered that gar is taking the blame for ridiculous reasons as well as other regrets he still carries he feels like since he has powers, he should have been able to stop all of those various tragedies, and finally, he admits he needs help. Bear, who is a, uh, uh, I don't know, is he a new god? I guess he's a new god. Um, or it's a person of new genesis. I don't know if there's a difference. There's a slight difference. Anyway, uh, Bear arrives at the, uh, meeting on new genesis, and I'm pretty sure Kilowog shits his pants and his lantern suit recycles the waste. It was a very odd thing to have included in the episode, but for whatever reason, they wanted us to know that. Um, then in the Phantom Zone, Superboy, Superboy is still talking to General Zod, who showed up in the last episode or two ago. He explains everything about the Phantom Zone for him. The Devourers are the creature that attacked him, and everything else is pretty much just nothingness. Uh, turns out that Zod and a bunch of his uh, Kryptonians, who honestly were the ones who were part of his like riot squad or whatever, they are all hiding out here together in the Phantom Zone. He mentally tells Ursa, his wife, that they are long playing him, him being Superboy, so they are... that's not good. <laughs> Uh, they ask Superboy about the Legion member that he carries around, no doubt aiming to kill her or just get rid of her in some way. Zod tells Superboy everything in the Phantom Zone is about maintaining, quote, superior will uh, to make things happen. There is some really random Zod chant thing that made me wildly uncomfortable to listen to. And then uh, Connor ends up bowing to Zod in the end. So no bueno again. In the end of the episode, Metron shows up to the new Genesis meeting and tells them all to come with him if they want the universe to survive. So clearly whatever's happening back there in his storage unit is not going to turn out too good. That leaves us with our final topic for the episode, which is the Multiverse of Madness precast. Prelude to the movie, which again, coming out Thursday, beware of spoilers as of, I would say, Wednesday to be safe. Um, Definitely. I've already seen spoilers of movies not even out, so hey. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to go over a couple of different topics here, right? We're going to start with general information on the movie, and then we're going to have confirmed characters, rumored characters, what we know about the plot, comics references, and then uh, a supposedly leaked info on the two credit scenes. So starting at the top here with the general info about the movie, the title Multiverse of Madness is a nod to both H.P. Lovecraft and John Carpenter. 
And in late 2021, it underwent six weeks of, quote, significant reshoots, prompting some raised eyebrows among fans and industry insiders alike. Cumberbatch belayed those fears, stating that the added photography was simply a way in which to add more goodies to the production wasn't able to nab during its strict pandemic shoot. Uh, part of the concern that raised for me, honestly, was putting too much into the movie uh, would be a bit tragic as well. Um, now, for confirmed characters, I tried to put these in a good order, and it just is not in a good order. So the most obvious ones being Dr. Stephen Strange, uh, Baron Mordo, uh, Wong, of course, and Christine Palmer, all returning characters from the previous movie. Uh, we also are going to have Rintra, whose first comic book appearance is Doctor Strange 81. Uh, you can see him in the trailers. He is the, like, bull-headed dude. We know that Captain Carter is going to be in the movie as a member of the Illuminati. Uh, we have seen her from behind in the trailer. Um, I'm not sure she's supposedly going to be the what-if version of... Um, or possibly she might be the comic version. There's a couple of different versions of Captain Carter that they could pull from or do an entirely new universe's version as well. Um, but I really hope, no matter what they do or where she's from, that it is a super buff Haley Atwell. We also know that we are going to have Lashana Lynch as Maria Rambeau. At this point, we have basically seen her pretty fairly clearly in the footage. Her first comic book appearance is... Uh, of Maria, that is, is Avengers 246. I would not say that she is a notable character in the comics, but that issue is probably about to skyrocket in value. She is obviously Maria from another universe, likely one where she didn't have Monica, so she wasn't as careful in her career, taking more risks without a child to go home to, relying on her. Maybe Carol didn't exist, or she just went up instead of Carol. I also think, and I honestly hope, that they're doing to Carol with Monica what they did to Peter Quill, I'm sorry, Maria, with Maria, what they did to Peter Quill with T'Challa Star-Lord in the What If show. And by that I mean that they're going to show us a far superior version of someone with the same hero origin story, more or less. Um, I hope that's what they're doing, and I, I super dig it. We know we're going to have Professor X in his yellow wheelchair. At this point, he is definitely a different one from a different universe than the Foxmen that we've seen um, because of the wheelchair, obviously, and because we have no reason to think that that Xavier would be have, having been involved in the Illuminati at some point and things still haven't gone for him the way that things they did. Uh, we know that this is going to be at least Patrick Stewart's voice, uh, possibly somebody wearing his face, we'll have to wait and see, and it is going to open the door, more than likely, for more X-Men characters and other mutants to join the MCU. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, Wolverine has been long speculated as their first dip into mutants in the MCU, so this is potentially where all of that is going to kick off from. We have the the twins, Tommy and Billy, Scarlet Witch's kids, Wanda Maximoff's kids, who we saw in WandaVision. They are going to be featured in this in, at the very least, dream sequences, if nothing else. Same as the Marvel Zombies. Uh, they are from the What If universe, and we are going to be seeing them in some form or another for a, at least a moment or so. Uh, there is a character called Sarah, who we know we're going to be seeing in the movie. Speculation is that she might be Sarah Wolf, uh, which I would prefer. She's a character who is Doctor Strange's assistant at a certain point in time. But based on the Funko Pop figure that has uh, leaked her existence in the movie, I would guess that it is one of the relations to Baron Mordo, his daughter, who is named Astrid in the comics, or his mother, who is also called Sarah in the comics. We know that Gargantos is going to show up. However, this is um, Shumagorath Gargantos, which is two different comic book entities. They are naming it Gargantos, but designing it more or less after Shumagorath, who is an elder god in the comics, whereas Gargantos is an obscure squid character. So um, I, I think they just did that basically to to simplify the name so that you hear the name Gargantos and you know, okay, that is a gigantic thing. It is huge. It's pretty self-explanatory. Finally, Cathan is a rumored, uh, well, that I should, I, put, I should have put Cathan in the rumors, but Cathan is rumored. 
uh, it's been speculated to be seen in the MCU since WandaVision a year and a half ago. Uh, and he is the Elder God who wrote the Darkhold. Um, now this final confirmed character is due to a spoiler leak, so plug your ears for 30 seconds. Uh, and that is Black Bolt, from, played by Anson Mount from the Inhumans TV show. Um, the apparent spoiler leak for, uh, that I saw photos from on Twitter uh, did confirm that he would be in there. I did not see Anson Mount, I did see Black Bolt though, so he will be appearing in some point, and that is the end of that spoiler. As for the rumored characters we're going to be see- we we might be seeing in this movie, uh, the Living Tribunal was seen in a trailer, possibly, but it could just be a tease or another statue or something, as we did see a uh, somewhat destroyed statue of the Living Tribunal in the Loki show. Clea, uh, one of my favorite Marvel characters of all time. There is no solid reason to assume that she'll be in it at all at this point, as there have been zero glimpses of her and only casting rumors at best. Uh, the purple, pink, blue kind of floating dimension that we see a lot of in the trailers is definitely the dark dimension, which in the comics is described as a realm of floating lands. I think the line they use is roughly that it would break any physicist's mind with its lack of logic of how it floats around, uh, which is exactly how that place in the trailer looks, so hopefully that checks out. Uh, Toby Maguire's Spider-Man, that was rumored since around December, uh, but was reportedly debunked just a few days ago, so sorry, Maguire fans, he will not be in it, most likely. Uh, Superior Spider-Man was... Spider-Man, oh my god. Superior Iron Man was debunked as well with a more clear teaser footage just a few days ago. Uh, That was my least favorite rumor, maybe of all time, for the MCU. Uh, And then Brother Voodoo, Uh, there is no word on casting, but there have been long-time rumors and a post-wrap gift from Sam Raimi to the crew was Doctor Strange issue 48, which does include his first meeting of Strange and Brother Voodoo. Another rumored character that is actually kind of a spoiler since that one... uh, leaked image did spoil it there in this movie so cover your ears again if you don't want to hear it that would be mr fantastic it does appear that john krasinski will be playing him for some portion of the movie as a member of the illuminati um we have been actually when i wrote this a few days ago i wrote that um you know we would know we would know that marvel's working on introducing the fantastic four and john watts will be directing Literally, just like two days after I wrote that, John Watts announced that he was backing out of the Fantastic Four project. Uh, that was the 29th <laughs> that that was announced. Um, so we actually do not have John Watts on board that. So uh, TBD, TB, to be reported, TBR uh, on who is going to be his replacement. Uh, Deadpool, we have three more here about who might be uh, rumored characters, right? So Deadpool rumored because his mask was seen in one of those movie posters. Um, could just be a tease, honestly. And Nicolas Cage is also rumored as Ghost Rider. I think that's mostly just fan desires. And finally, Sidorak, which I think is probably more likely than not that we'll be seeing Sidorak. Um, Sidorak is the being who gives the Crimson Gem to Juggernaut in the comics. And also the Crimson Bands of Sidorak being a very famous uh, Doctor Strange spell. Uh, And there's speculation that the red demonic stuff we see in the trailers is the being Sidorak. As for things that we know about the plot, first point being the Illuminati, which is rumored to consist of Baron Mordo, Black Bolt, Captain Carter, Clea, Reed Richards, and Professor X. One page I came across claims to know that Balder the Brave and Magneto will also be involved, but lack the details they had with the other characters. I think the only reason that they would use Magneto is for the Wanda Maximoff relation, otherwise his inclusion here would not make very much sense. I think that the Illuminati is probably going to appear in the beginning of the movie, or at least earlier on than anybody expects right now, taking in Strange for the chaos that he causes in No Way Home, and then sending him on some mission to the Dark Dimension to stop Clea, potentially. The reasoning being because Mordo is, his whole goal is like he doesn't want any more sorcerers, he thinks there's too many sorcerers, so maybe after she start, if she started ruling after whatever happened with Dormammu, Dormammu, Dormammu in the first movie, 
and now Mordo wants to get rid of her because she's just another sorcerer, so he convinces the Illuminati to do so by using Strange, right? That's kind of one theory I have. Speaking of Mordo, his side of the plot, he's played by, I'm so sorry, but I cannot pronounce his name. I'm not going to try. I'm sorry. I just embarrass myself more. Uh, but Mordo, he wants to eliminate all sorcerers, which, as I said, severely puts Clea's potential role into question, as well as his own role on the Illuminati. Theories that Mordo um, is going to, the Mordo shown in the trailer is a variant, not the one that we met in the first Doctor Strange movie, is a pretty interesting theory, um, and that maybe the real Mordo, or the one that we know, is the true villain. Um, maybe they are forced to work together to save their dimension, um, and after what Steven did in No Way Home, it definitely shores, shows what Mordo was afraid of and goes a long way in justifying his crusade in ridding the world of other wizards and sorcerers. For Scarlet Witch slash Wanda Maximoff's side of the plot, uh, we last saw Wanda isolating herself from society while grieving her family and searching for a way to bring back uh, the twins in the final episode of WandaVision. Uh, she may become a true villain of sorts here in Multiverse of Madness, but that just is going to be something we're going to have to wait and see. It does seem to be, there do seem to be separate Wanda and Scarlet Witch entities, or possibly just multiple versions of them. Um, it could be that one of them is Lore, who is the evil Scarlet Witch from the comics, who first appears in Scarlet Witch number 2, December 1993. She's a version of Scarlet Witch who is also a Nexus being, as our Wanda is, but Lore was out to conquer dimensions by destroying her fellow Nexus beings and feeding on their power. She employed Master Pandemonian and several demon versions of the Avengers, which, she, which could be referenced with an evil sorcerer crashing the party with the marvel zombies or something Sor sorcerer witch sorcerer Woo. uh it, it could also be dark scarlet who is wanda in a different costume and with an evil persona which you see first appearing in west coast avengers number 55 also, Wanda's twins from WandaVision join a growing list of Young Avengers characters popping up throughout the MCU, uh, one of which is our next topic, America Chavez, and how we are going to be introduced to her. She is being played by Zochi Gomez and is set to play a huge role in Multiverse of Madness as a sidekick, help sidekick helping Doctor Strange navigate the multiverse. Her powers include inter interdimensional travel, making her a key asset to the film and future films dealing with aspects of the multiverse. When we meet her, America is being chased into the MCU by, quote, Mysteri uh, by mysterious creatures intent on siphoning off her power and using it for their own nefarious ends, unquote. Uh, that is probably going to be Gargantos. What's the relevance of Christine Palmer? She is Doctor Strange's ex-girlfriend and in the know about his identity. Uh, some theories are that she's going to be a version of Night Nurse. Night Nurse has no powers of her own in the comics, but she is a highly trained and certified nurse who has made it her life's mission to treat heroes off the books. Three characters have adopted that identity, and one of them includes Palmer, also Claire Temple from the Marvel TV series. Other comic versions include Linda Carter and Georgia Jenkins. There is another theory about Christine Palmer that she is the invisible woman from another dimension, and she is marrying Reed Richards in that wedding scene from the trailers. The magical backdrop of the entire movie um, is going to be a pretty important thing with Wanda having the dark hold and strange is going to be finding the book of Vishanti, which is something that we saw in the trailer in the apparent dark dimension. Um, and going to get that book is going to be a big goal of the movie. Allegedly, as pointed out in an article on inverse, strange does use the book of Vishanti on uh, one notable time in the comics to tell if any new Avengers are lying to him during Secret Invasion, dealing with identifying hidden scrolls in disguise. Interestingly, possibly, is the fact that they're filming Secret Invasion right now, the story that that plotline takes place in. It makes sense, then, that this writer at Inverse speculates maybe this book will tie into the Secret Invasion show somehow. 
Also, Vishanti themselves are three godlike entities dedicated to defending Earth and acting as patrons to the Sorcerer Supreme. They are also called those who sit above. Finally, in our plot, we know there are going to be multiple Stranges. One is going to be Defender Strange, wearing a costume from Marvel Point One, number one. We also know there is going to be Supreme Strange, and another evil Strange we might see would be Necromancer, who we saw in the comics in Doctor Strange, Source of Supreme, number 46, who is from another reality. If you are looking for some comic reading material to reference before the movie comes out, I have a few suggestions. Uh, it, it, is, it is somewhat limited, but you can go back through um, the other things that I've mentioned before, like with Dark Scarlet and Necromancer, um, and see what, what those issues all are about. But for America Chavez, I recommend Young Avengers Volume 2, uh, where it has the Jamie McKelvey art that is the superior Young Avengers series for sure. Uh, you will want to watch What If on Disney+. Plus because uh, that will definitely be tying into this very heavily. And three comics that you can read, three single issues, I would recommend New Avengers number seven, which is the first appearance of the Illuminati. New Avengers Illuminati number one, which is of course their first solo Illuminati title. And finally, New Avengers number three, which is the issue where Doctor Strange uses a spell to wipe Captain America's memories on behalf of the Illuminati, because Cap was going to rat them out for being bad people. And so they just wipe his memories of it. <laughs> Good stuff, good stuff. Finally, uh, this last thing that we're going to discuss for the movie is the alleged post credit scenes that have leaked according to a 4chan post uh, that I then picked up off of Reddit. Um, so if you don't want that to be, to be spoiled, I guess this is the end of the episode for you. Bye! Uh, but this is what the two post credit scenes for everybody else are going to be according to 4chan, which could literally be pulled out of their butt. So... Uh, for the mid-credits scene, it says Doctor Strange is sleeping after the events of Multiverse of Madness and has a nightmare where he sees himself training an apprentice, a ruined New York City, a dead Wong, Dormammu's sister, sister Umar, and a glimpse of Kang the Conqueror. Conqueror. He then wakes up with a third eye and hears the voice of Clea, played by Charlize Theron, saying, help me. The end credit scene, it says, is Deadpool, along with Cable, Domino, and Vanessa, exploring the Illuminati facility due to the Illuminati's multiversal gates being left open after the Wanda fight. Deadpool is joking with the bodies of some members, including making a reference to The Office, which makes sense because John Krasinski. Deadpool then makes a joke slash fourth wall break about Patrick Stewart, Professor X, being dead again for the third time, so apparently he's going to die in this as well. Um, yeah, so I, I I can't speak to the legitimacy of those leaks about the gun credit scene, but, um, I, the second one I would say would be pretty funny. The first one I don't particularly like the idea of because I really, really don't want Clea's first introduction to be a damsel in distress. Like, I so badly do not want that. I understand that's more or less what she was when we meet her in the comics, but come on, 1960. It is the year 2022. We can do better than that, guys. <laughs> but the inclusion of Umar does get me really excited because Umar is Clea's mother, as well as Dormammu's sister. So that is uh, taking a step into Clea's mythology, which I love. Uh, I am a pro on it, which is not even a joke. You can go to my website and you'll you'll see the evidence. But um, yeah, so that that's the supposed leaks and credit scenes. And that wraps up the episode, folks. Um, thank you for listening to whatever portion of it that you did. I have the next episode is going to be coming out next week, Monday the 9th of May, and that will be covering a spoiler-free Multiverse of Madness movie reaction, uh, Moon Knight finale coverage, Young Justice episode 21, a free comic book day wrap-up, as well as the regular weekly picks and polls, general industry news, as usual, etc., etc., etc. So, um, yeah, find me on social media, join the crew, let's get friendly. Uh, that sounded creepier than I meant to. Uh, happy belated Earth Day. Ooh, 
I guess that too. But I meant to say happy belated May Day and happy early Cinco de Mayo to those who celebrate either of those occasions. Um, we will be back, as I said, on the 9th. Oh, oh, so I had, I was going to do a Madeline Pryor podcast to whip out real quick before New Mutants 25 was supposed to come out last week, which it's been pushed back <laughs> till the end of this month. So we're going to get the Madeline Pryor podcast out a little bit later. Later, uh, And the Patsy one will probably be out before that. But before that, tomorrow, fingers crossed, um, I am going to be recording the Matt Reeves The Batman podcast with my husband, who is so into it, I find it hilarious. So um, that'll hopefully be a lot of fun. So keep your eyes and ears open for that one, kids. Otherwise, have a sweaty week, stay hydrated, and... Um, Try not to get, like, actually sweaty, I guess. Unless you want to. Peace.